Good afternoon. We start with our next talk. E. Sundaram again is a very very low profile fund manager, so I don't know how many of you know about him. But uh, my memory go back to the days before there was an expressway between Pune and Bombay. I used to live in Bombay, and Nimesh and I would be on the platform the father and he would walk with Prashant Jain. They used to also visit companies. Was Zurich there or before? Or a, before. Twentieth <coughs> century. <laughs> so, that's really a long time ago. But uh, he has a very very good understanding of the markets and uh, very similar to Prashant and all the other value investors. It has been very quiet. In fact, uh, we've been try trying to get him here for some time, but this is the first time. He is here. Last year, he threatened to come to this I think it's going to be a good talk, definitely. And uh, there is a lot that he understands. The one thing that one has to learn from him is what not to do. Because he can sit quiet for a really long time. His investment style is such. He is now managing money with Pro America. And uh, that's a prudential joint venture in India. They are big in insurance and pension solutions all over the world. And uh, now they are here. We already have 21,000 crores of total assets under management. And I'm sure the way the markets are today and the way he will go about doing it, it is very much. Thank you.
It's a it's an old story. Many of you may have heard of it already. It's a story from the Mahabharata. <coughs> you know, after losing the game of dice, the Pandavas and Draupadi were forced to spend 12 years in the forest, followed by one year in hiding. This incident occurred during the 12 years they spent in the forest. It was a hot summer day and the Pandavas were wandering in the forest in search of something. When suddenly Yudhishthir sat, sat down and said, My dear brothers, I am too tired, I am thirsty, I can't walk anymore. So somebody go and fetch water for all of us. So Nakul climbed the nearby tree and looked around. And he thought he could spot a pond at a distance. And he set off in that direction. And sure enough, he saw a pond with lovely crystal clear water. He was delighted and before fetching water for his brother, he was very thirsty himself. So he wanted to quench his own thirst. So he got inside the water, cupped his hands like this. He was about to drink the water when he heard a voice. <clears throat> the voice said, stop, don't drink this water. This pond belongs to me. If you want to drink this water, you should first answer my questions. If you drink this water without answering my questions, you will be dead. Who thought it was some practical joke being played by somebody and he disregarded the warning, he drank the water and he immediately fell down dead. After a while, Yudhishthir got anxious and he sent Sahadev in search of Nakul and also in search of water. So Sahadev came there, he saw his, he was shocked to see his brother lying dead. But before investigating, he wanted to quench his own thirst. So same thing, same warning, same disregard for the warning and same result. <clears throat> to cut the long story short, two other people met with the same fate. Arjun and Bhim met with the same fate. But there was a difference. Arjun being the great archer that he was, he shot a few arrows in the direction of the voice. But he couldn't do anything to harm that being. It was actually the Lord Yama, who, the, the Dharmaraja himself, who had come to test the Pandavas. Finally, Yudhishthir came. But Yudhishthir was wiser than the rest of them he immediately realized that there was something supernatural about the whole thing. Because no ordinary human being could defeat his brothers in battle. Bhim and Arjun were two of the greatest warriors in the world at that point of time. It was not easy for anybody to defeat them. And besides, there was no sign of a battle. There, was, there were no wounds on their bodies and, and it was as if they were sleeping peacefully. So he ruled out poison also because of that reason. And it is highly unlikely that four fit men could die like this in a short span of time. And therefore he saw something supernatural about the whole thing. And therefore he saw a way to redeem the situation. So when that warning came, Yudhishthir said, please ask your questions. So in rapid succession, several questions were asked. And all of them were satisfactorily answered by Yudhishthir. And the Lord, while being pleased with his level of knowledge, and also with his impartiality, because he did not distinguish between his blood brothers and his step brothers, the Lord granted the lives of all four brothers back. This is the story. One of the questions asked was, what is the strangest thing in the world? What is the strangest thing in the world? <clears throat> to which Yudhishthira had replied, my Lord, every day man sees enough evidence that life in this earth is not permanent. He sees his friends dying, he sees his neighbors dying, he sees his relatives dying. So he knows that life is in this, in this world is not permanent. But when it comes to his own life, he doesn't want to die. He wants to live forever. This, my lord, is the strangest thing in the world. <clears throat> now, in the days of the Mahabharata, there was no stock market. <laughs> there were no asset management companies. <coughs> There were no portfolio managers. <laughs> there were no wealth managers. There was no value research. There was no economic times. And most importantly, there was no CNBC. <laughs> <clears throat> Come to think of it, our ancestors are all pretty lucky people. 
But had these characters all been in existence at the time of the Mahabharat, I think Yudhishthir's reply to that question could have been something like this. <laughs> <coughs> he would have said, my lord, it's not a single factor, but a combination of three factors that cumulatively make up for being the strangest thing in the world. Number one, an average investor generally is hesitant to buy when the price is low, but is more willing to buy when the price is high. In his anxiety to invest in the best, he makes what is good an enemy of what is the best. And number three, because the best is usually defined as something that has given the maximum return in the last 12 months, in the anxiety to beat the best, he dilutes the quality of what is being purchased. This combination, my lord, is the strangest thing in the world. And when Yudhishthir said this, not only did his three brothers, four brothers immediately spring back to life, but far away in Hastinapur, Duryodhan, Dushasan and Shakuni immediately collapsed. <laughs> See, fund managers have the habit of cracking some sick jokes in order to sustain the interest of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> my, but my attempt at humor should not divert your attention from the three points that I'm raising today. And these are important points. <clears throat> And in fact, this is the style of investing that I follow. There is no best investment. There are good investment products and there are bad investment products. There is no best investment product. Right? Because the best is defined under very narrow parameters of, as, of who has delivered the highest return in the immediately preceding 12 months or immediately preceding 3 months, as the case may be. Right? No attempt is made to define what risk has been taken to achieve that return, which is a very important parameter. Right? The <clears throat> other thing is, the tendency of even allegedly professional investors to <coughs> buy when the price is high and be less, less interested in buying when the price is low, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paradox. Because in every other form of economic activity, a low price is considered attractive. In the stock market, it is not. <coughs> yes or no? You know, mid caps and small caps are so favored today. Four years ago, when it was time to, when mid cap funds were being launched, most people were running after FMPs. Yes or no? Yeah. <coughs> so what do we do? What does an investor do at this point of time? An investor who does not, like me, does not have the capability to predict, does not have the ability to out analyze everybody else right there is a tendency to you know everybody believes that he is above average yes or no but it is mathematically impossible <laughs> so let us somebody in the morning i think ame's uh, presentation was very clear he said don't try to clone anybody it's a very important point now all of us are enamored with warren buffett right you know we try to read the uh, newsletters that he has written, his annual reports, etc., etc. After reading four annual reports, we are convinced that we are at least 95% Warren Buffett. <laughs> but <laughs> let's face it, we are no Warren Buffett. Right? For that matter, we are no Rakesh Jinjinwala either. The, the sooner we realize this, the better it is for everybody. But does, does that mean that an ordinary person cannot take benefit of the stock market? No. An ordinary person with average intelligence, I am talking about myself now, right? If it's very much possible for a person of this kind to benefit from the stock market. All that he needs to do is to avoid three mistakes. That's it. There's a fourth one which we shall talk about later. 
Number one is just avoid buying stocks when they are too expensive. That's all. <laughs> there is a there is a method which I follow to determine whether it is expensive or not. That we'll discuss later. This is, none of this is a perfect method. There is no perfect method. But it's a method that has worked for me in the last so many years. So I presume there must be something good about it. <coughs> How do you determine whether it is too expensive or not? <coughs> if the valuation of today is significantly higher than its 10-year average valuation, then stay away from it. What I mean by significant? It should be greater than, you know, that the statistical measure of two, two standard deviations account for 68% of total uh, values. Three standard deviations account for 95% and so on and so forth. So we are not worried about the standard deviation below the mean. We are worried about the standard deviation above the mean. So if it's 33, 34% above the long-term average valuation, stay away from it. There is no stock in the world that you must own. None. There is none. If you lose one opportunity, you will get another one. It's okay. There are 6,000 listed stocks in India. You need 25 to 30 of them to build a portfolio. You will get your chances. I don't mind losing any number of opportunities. I just don't want to lose money permanently. That's all. My simple ambition is that. <coughs> So, if today's valuation is at its historical average or below its historical average, it's worth start. It's worth to start a study on that company. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying you buy it immediately. If it is significantly above historical averages, just stay away from it. There is one more metric that has to be used. Today's valuation is measured not only in terms of its historical average, it's also measured in terms of its expected sustainable growth rate in earnings. Because the, the share may be coming out of a long period of recession. So if you compare historical averages, it may not be relevant. So it is also important to look at the expected growth, sustainable growth rate in earnings. And no company is capable of growing at 50% sustainably. It's impossible. This is one thing. The second thing is about the anxiety to invest in the best. I think this is causing serious problems. <clears throat> In his introductory uh, remarks, Durgesh Bai said that I we used to work for Zurich, right? Zurich Mutual Fund at that. During the technology boom, we were working for Zurich, a company called Zurich Asset Management, which was acquired by HDFC. That, that is a history. Now, no discussion on valuation is, is, is complete without a discussion on, on the technology boom of 1999-2000. In the calendar year 1999, the fund that is today called the HDFC Equity Fund, at that time, it was called the Zurich Equity Fund. It generated a return of 160% in one year. <clears throat> we were managing it together, the three of us, uh, Prashant, Jain, Chandresh, Nigam, and me. But it was not considered good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Because there were funds that were generating a 250% return and even some funds that were generating 300% return. So that is the time when this thought process began to take shape. If a 160% return in one year is not going to satisfy the investment community, nothing is ever going to satisfy. <laughs> yes or no? Because there is no such thing as enough money. There is nothing. When the market is bearish, an investor, all that he wants is to beat fixed income returns. But today you go and sell a mid-cap fund saying I'll beat fixed income returns, you'll probably be booted up. Yes or no? Because these things keep changing. 
and 80% of the fund, the product that I'm presently managing in 2014 calendar year generated 84% return. It was not considered good enough because there were products that were giving 115. Because anything that you do, some fellow will be doing it better than you. <laughs> yes or no? So if you try to compete saying that I'm the best, you're in for trouble. <clears throat> because there is no best. And the best keeps changing. Every three months, the best keeps changing. In the last 10 years, if you take December as the base, in 10 Decembers, there have been 10 different best products. If you make April as the base, in 10 different Aprils, there are 10 different best products. And the April guys are different from the December guys. All this is true. So this attempt to be the best is a futile attempt. It doesn't work. Instead of that, the focus of the investor should be to not do anything stupid, which is, which is actually more than what most of us can accomplish. <coughs> How do you safeguard yourself from investing in, in, in uh, poor quality businesses? There are some guidelines. The first guideline that I use is that I look at a company <coughs> with a track record of at least 15 years. I don't buy anything new. I am not against new companies. I think the venture capital industry is doing a good service for the capital market by identifying new technologies and encouraging new entrepreneurs. <coughs> but remember, cloning is not good. I am not a venture capital investor. So if I attempt to be one, it will be disaster. I am not a venture capital investor. So I, I don't want to buy any new company, even he may be the most revolutionary company in the world. He may, he may promise to change the world, but if he doesn't have a 15 year track record, I will not even look at him. I know I will miss several opportunities, it's okay. But I, I am also aware <coughs> that in venture capital investing, for every one successful Google, there are 99 failures. That's the chance that I'm not willing to take. So 15 years is important because in, in 15 years, any company goes through at least one full business cycle. If it has gone through a business cycle, it has gone through at least one difficult period. If it has gone through a difficult period, the management of that company would have hopefully learned some valuable lessons from that difficult period, which they are unlikely to learn from a textbook. I'm essentially looking for companies that have the which have suffered at least one hard knock in life. But that's a lesson they are unlikely to forget. So 15 years is a track record, which is a measurable thing. Because it, it, in our definition of quality, the parameters of definition of quality should also be measurable. You can't have a confused concept of quality and expect your investors to believe you. Right? The second parameter is a minimum scale of operations. And for this, I have set a threshold of 400 crores of revenue, not market cap, revenue. <clears throat> of course, we may revise it in the next few years because these things keep uh, in need constant revision in, in every few years. But right now, it's 400 crores of revenue. <clears throat> we'll talk about exceptions later. The third and fourth parameter of my, my way of defending my portfolio against going into mediocrity is consistency of high return on capital and consistency of the ability to generate positive free cash flow. I look for the return on capital employed over the last 10 years, not average, individually each year for the last 10 years. If in any one year the company has generated 20% or higher, it, it's pretty stiff target I know, but let's keep it stiff. 20% or higher return on capital employed, for that year it gets a score of 1. Anything less than 20%, we give it a score of 0. So it's a simple 1, 0 ranking. Even if it is 19.5%, it gets 0. So done over 10 years, the maximum possible score any company can make is 20, 10 points. It can generate 20% or higher in each of the previous 10 years. I am also looking for the ability of that company to generate positive free cash flow defined as cash flow after working capital changes and after fixed capital expenditure. It should be positive. Here I have no threshold in mind. It should be greater than zero. That's all. It 
can be one rupee of positive free cash flow, it can be a thousand crores, but it should be above zero. A positive free cash flow generally tells us two things. It tells us that the company is, has the ability to live within its means. It also tells us that the figures are more believable. Net profits, as we all know, can be adjusted with clever accounting. Cash flow, you cannot adjust like that. So if you have a positive free cash flow, you, you tend to believe that, that, that balance sheet a little more. So every year of positive free cash flow gets a score of 1. Done over 10 years, here also the maximum possible is 10. Cumulatively on these two parameters, a company can score a maximum of 20 out of 20. Our cutoff is 14. This is for a product I am personally managing. Of course, not all products will have this, these parameters. I am talking of the product that I am managing. So the investment universe of this product consists of companies with a 15 year track record or longer, a revenue of 400 crores or higher, and a score of 14 out of 20 or higher on these two parameters. The number of companies that are eligible is 183 companies. This is based on 2016 figures. Now when 2017 figures are out, sometime in August or September all the annual reports will be out, so we'll do it again. So it's likely that it may rise by a few points or fall by a few points, but it has been at this ballpark for the last 5-6 years. <coughs> What I am essentially trying to do is only this. By staying away from companies that are, whose valuation is well above average or valuation is well above its estimated sustainable growth rate in earnings, I am reducing the chance of the first mistake which investors make. By restricting my choice to companies of this kind, I am reducing my chance of the second mistake. Because no company that qualifies on this, these parameters can be called a faltu company. I don't think so. Of course, we pay attention to what the company is likely to do in the next few years, but the, these are the, the filters, to, the initial filters. <clears throat> there are other qualitative parameters. If there is anything in the track record that suggests that minority shareholders' interests have been seriously compromised, you will not buy that share. It's okay. You don't have to, as I said, you don't have to buy anything. There is no rule which says that you have to buy this company. There is no such company in the world. <clears throat> if you think that this sounds very boring and old-fashioned, you're right. <coughs> it is old-fashioned. But the damn thing works. <clears throat> it may sound very boring, but the returns it has generated is not bad. As I said, my intention is not to be number one. That's a dangerous ambition to have, believe me. My, my intention is to be good. I know fully well that there are several other fund managers who are also good. I'm not trying to say that this is better than any of their products, no. The advantage of an investor seeking to invest in a good product is that he can choose several of them at the same time. The disadvantage of trying to invest only in the best product is that you can choose only one. <coughs> and the best keeps changing. Every few months the best keeps changing. We can talk examples if you like, but this is primarily our approach to investing in this product. Stay away from these mistakes. Stay away from high valuations. Stay away from companies that don't show the ability to which have lost their ability to compete, essentially. A, a, a company's ability to compete is primarily measured by its return on capital and its, and its uh, ability to generate positive free cash flows. <clears throat> and not only ability to compete, but also willingness to share the profits with you and me. So if the company has shown less inclination to share their profits with you and me, and this we can judge only by the track record. I am not a fan of, uh, you know, Body language based investing. <laughs> I have to look at the track record. If there is anything in the track record that suggests that minority shareholders' interests have been seriously compromised, stay away from that company. It's okay. <clears throat> See, as I said, 
we have been doing this in this company for the last four years. Before that, I was doing it in other companies. But at this company, every year in the last four years, we have beaten the market quite comfortably. But we don't do it on a quarterly basis. There are times when we trade. For example, in the last three months, six months, we have trained. But so what? It's okay. It doesn't matter. Uh, any questions? Any at this stage? Any questions? Uh, you talked about the minimum scale of operation. Could you talk a bit more about sort of how you came to that? And I mean, is there? I mean, is the number of four hundred crore? No, it's there's no scientific reason for that. It's uh, I wanted a good combination of large cap, mid cap, and small cap. That's the that's the uh, reason. Uh, and and as I said, this is subject to revision every few years. It's it's not uh, if it is slightly below 400 crores, I may still invest in that company as an exception. And there are I have to talk about exceptions also because if we strictly follow this rule, there are some sectors which will completely get left out. So there should always be space for some exceptions. And we have kept apart a maximum of 25% of the portfolio for exception. Because any bank that I buy, any NBFC that I buy will be an exception. Not that I have too much of them right now. I have very few. But any bank, even HDFC bank, which is considered the best bank in the country, will not be able to generate free cash flow. It, no bank in the world can generate free cash flow. But it's not advisable for us to leave out completely the banking sector. So for that sake, we need to make exceptions. <coughs> The second reason why exceptions may be necessary is that some companies may be having a sales turnover of 390 crores. If it is significantly below than our threshold, we will not buy it. But if it is slightly below our threshold and we are confident that the company will grow well beyond 400 crores in the years to come, provided it is qualified on other parameters, we will buy that, but it has to come in as an exception. And the third reason why exceptions are necessary is that while it is important to be disciplined in investing, it's also important that we don't become too dogmatic. There should always be some element of flexibility in equity investing. For example, there may be highly cyclical businesses. I had bought a company called Great Eastern Shipping about two years ago. Great Eastern did not qualify on these parameters. But it's not a weak company. It just happens to be in an industry which is highly cyclical. And it was available at a very steep discount to its net asset value. That's why we, we bought that share. So there are exceptions, but exceptions are restricted. The total exceptions cannot exceed 25%. As we speak now, it's about 16% of the portfolio. Any other question? Yes, sir. Uh, when you say valuations, and they have to be uh, either at 10 years average or lower than 10 years average. Or lower than its estimated sustainable growth rate in earnings. OK. Right. So you're talking of from valuation, you're talking from PE perspective? Uh, Sometimes it is PE. Okay. In not all cases it can be PE. In, in financial companies it has to be priced to adjusted book value. Okay. In some other cases it may be enterprise value to sales or market cap to sales. Okay. Whatever metric is used, the same metric is used for the last 10 years. Okay. And also if you're looking at a 10 year period, that period is obviously quite quite a long period. Yes. And during that period a company would obviously would have changed uh, probably would have changed significantly if we are looking at a 400, yes. 500 crore sort of a company. Correct, correct. So let's say 10 year or 9 year back, the sort of valuation that the company was, had at that point of time might be significantly different than the valuations which are there at present because the company is... It is possible, it is possible. But I said, as I said, it is not a perfect system. It should, we should have a, a benchmark to which we, we arrive at a conclusion, right? Now, that benchmark I cannot alter for individual cases. The benchmark should be common. If I make an exception, it should come in as an exception. The rule is the same. So just to get an idea, I mean, what sort of uh, companies uh, would they be, uh, if you could? See, the, the companies that score 20 on 20 are the, the usual suspects, you know, the Hindustan Unilever and, you know, Infosys and uh, Asian Paints. But they will not qualify on the valuation part. Exactly, exactly. So what sort of companies <coughs> would... Uh, there, but there are other companies which, which qualify. <laughs> 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 so would you care okay to share just one name, uh, just, just to get an idea? What sort of company? See, what I'm about to say may be different from what other fund managers have said in the previous, uh, you know. I am overweight on IT right now. <laughs> right. 
It is not that uh, I think that it will recover in the next two quarters. It is just that I think that they have not lost their ability to compete. And they are reporting at valuations that are well below their historical averages. So, and I have not chosen all IT companies. I have chosen the strongest ones that I could find. It's an opinion, that's all. I am not infallible. I am not claiming to be infallible. But it's, it's, it's like this. Why does a share price rise? A share price rises because of there is an enhanced level of expectation around that share, about its ability to grow its earnings, right? So, it is my opinion that a good way to begin, a good place to begin, is look at a stock where the level of expectations is low to begin with. So, the, the, there is a, an element of margin of safety already built in there. Now, within that, don't choose a weak company. Mm. Choose a strong company with a strong balance sheet with a strong set of people running that company. And a, and, and a company where you believe that the difficulty it is going through is a temporary difficulty. I can't predict when that difficulty will get away. But I know it will get away. I am confident it will get away. That's the, that's the idea. Yes, sir. In this filter when you are using, you know, now IT will come, pharma will come. <coughs> so do you do you uh, adjust for any structural changes that you see in the industry? Yes, of course we do. For example, I don't think when I say I buy Infosys, I am not buying Infosys for the kind of returns that we have been used to in Infosys in the in the late 90s or early 2000s. I also think that the best days of Infosys as a stock are over. I, I don't think we are buying it for a 50%, 60% CAGR. That is not the intention. But we are buying it because at these valuations, it provides a margin of safety. That's, that's my opinion. It, certainly, it's not going to give spectacular returns. That is not the intention. Yes, sir. Do you have some rules for selling when you Excuse me. Yes. The rules for selling are only four. The assumption with which the share was bought in the first place becomes invalid. In that case, I will say, irrespective of whether it is a profit or a loss or whether it is a short term or a long term profit. If the assumptions become invalid, then it's a sell. And these assumptions have to be verified roughly once every quarter. Not uh, Generally, not more frequently than that. Uh, the second and most common reason to sell the share is when the, when the share has gone well beyond what we think it is worth. No. If, uh, if, if you buy a share at 100 and if we think it is worth 200, let's say as an example, if it approaches 200, I'm, I'm not going to sell it. But in the same time period, if it goes well beyond 300, I may think of selling it. But at that time also, we evaluate whether for a fresh inflow that is coming in, I would still be happy buying this share. Maybe not with the same percentage, with the low percentage. If I am still happy buying the share, I will not sell it. The third reason why a share is sold is for the same level of perceived risk. There is a superior opportunity available. Right? I can give you straight away two examples. You know, in 2013, when I started this portfolio, I preferred Ikra over Brazil. It was much cheaper. Then because Moody's acquired a majority stake in Ikra, it, it became more expensive than Brazil. So I switched from Ikra to Brazil. That's one example. I had also started buying FAG bearings at that time. It was much cheaper than SKF. Then FAG became more expensive than SKF. Both are good companies. Both have got strong balance sheets and good competitive position. But this became cheaper, so it, it, it was a switch. That's the, the two examples. The last reason I sell a share is when the client wants a redemption, either a full or a partial redemption. In that case, I have to sell. <coughs> when you said the second reason is that it is well beyond what it's worth. Do you have a valuation parameter? The same like we discussed. The same we discussed. It, if it if it is gone, if we purchase it at a at a valuation that is below its historical average, and it is gone more than two standard deviations above its historical average, it's a it's a case for a sale. I have to take care about one thing though, because I am not managing a mutual fund portfolio. I am managing a PMS portfolio. So taxation is an important difference. 
So if I sell within 12 months of holding, the client suffers capital gains taxes. Capital gains taxes, in my opinion, is a highly avoidable expense. So generally, we don't sell without, before 12 months. Very, very rarely. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about a transaction for 15 years. Right. Me, it has to be existence for 15 years? Existence for 15 years. Not the listed oh, track record. The, the, the financial should be available for at least 10 years. And it, it should have existed for 15 years. So in that case, sir, you, uh, you might escape, uh, escape in, in for, say, you know, if you, if you see the existence of 15 years, 10 years. Sorry? If, if you see the track record last 15 years, you may escape uh, in for, say, no, I have not scared. I just want to discuss the Infosys post 20 or 20 or not. Uh, At the time of listing, yeah. 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 Listing, yeah. I am not fine. So now it's completed, uh, you know, so many years after listing. I am talking of now. Yeah, yeah. Anything new, if it is new, if it is not, if it is a company that has already existed for 15 years but coming out with an IPO now, I may consider it. But if it's a brand new company with only four years of existence, I will not buy it. In that case, sir, sir yeah. just yes, I like. See, uh, we make, we make this Infosys, Bharti, and uh, even SBC bank. And these three were uh, only dynasty from the time. No, you, you want me to go back in time and see what I would have done in 1995? Just <laughs> like it is, uh, you know. It's, it's if, if, let's say, a new bank is coming for an IPO today and it has got all the ingredients of HDFC bank, I will not buy it. The, the way these uh, small cap mutual funds are gone up, so with the parameters of your second 20% CEO, the capital required return, very difficult to find good companies that have reasonable values in them. Good companies in small cap space, yes. I don't have any small caps. <laughs> I, I have one or two, but it's a very, very risky. Yes, you're right. It's, it's getting difficult to get good quality companies at good values. Yes. But uh, as I said, sir, you don't need to buy everything. You need 20, 25 companies to build a portfolio. There are 6,000 companies in India, out of which maybe 300 of them are of good investable quality. Out of 300, I need 25. I find my 25. Yes, sir. You said one one neck in life. So, uh, uh, can you elaborate like what happened with you? Sorry? One neck in life is that I should have uh, met like it. Uh, uh, yeah. You should have had one knock in life. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, uh, what happened with DV's laboratories? Yeah. So, uh, I, I, I started, I increased my exposure to DV's after December 2016. Okay. I, I had a small position in DV's, but I made it a significant position after it. I have DVs in the portfolio. After that, FDI, FDI, yes. FDI. Yes, after that, yes. Sure. Yes, sir. How do you allocate rates to the different stocks? Yeah, it's a, it's a function of two or three things. It's a function of, I, I generally don't go beyond, the theoretical limit that I will go is 10% in a single stock, but practically I don't exceed 6 to 7% in any stock. And I don't go beyond 30% in any one sector. That's the theoretical limit. But practically it's, it is not exceeded 20% in any one sector. It's a function of few things. It's a function of my assessment of the, primarily it's a function of my assessment of the ability of the company to compete in its marketplace. That's the primary thing. Second <coughs> thing is, its ability to grow its revenues and profits. Third is of course the liquidity that the stock offers. If it is, if there are two companies which are equally good and one happens to be more liquid than the other, obviously I choose the first one. I am assuming that valuations are similar across the two companies. That's the other factor. So these are the, I think the most important thing in investing is assessment of that company's ability to successfully compete in the marketplace. It's far more important than short-term profit growth. That's, uh, that's my view of things. 
Yes, sir. Uh, if you say that the parameters you have, most of the time, the high growth stories won't come into your parameters? Who says? That's, all. that's, that's the question. If the high growth story is being discounted already, then it will not come. But there are some high growth stories which are not discounted. But if at all you can uh, give some examples of your past where high growth stories were part and in which year or what was the time? It was a recession, it was a <coughs> bull market, it was a bear market, it was a moderate market. Sir, in 2000, just you don't have to go very far. 2013, okay. 2013 okay. most of the industrial stocks were completely true. Almost the entire mid and small cap sectors were completely yeah. Yeah. Only FMCG was going on. We know that. Good companies like Rival Norton, Vesuvius, they were all completely ignored. Or even uh, Cummins, for that matter. They were ignored. They were good quality industrial companies. Same thing happened in FMCG in 2007. The world was running after real estate and power sector and, and construction companies. Hindustan Unilever, just about 10 12 years ago, was available at a dividend yield of 4.5%. Difficult to believe, but it's true. Yes. Asian paints were available at a reasonable price. These were all called widow stocks at that time. You know, only widows will buy for dividend yield. <laughs> then what happened? You know, they did not become any more aggressive in their growth. What happened was that the rest of the world collapsed. So fellows who were growing at 50%, 60% suddenly saw their growth rate dip to negative. So these widows, widows were still growing at 10 12%. So 10, 12 percent suddenly became very sexy because everybody else was drowning. Sure. So we then reached a stage where people were willing to pay almost anything for that 10, 12 percent growth. That was also wrong. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not asking you personally about the stock, but humans still in your parameters? <laughs> that was the question. Either you hold it or not, that's a secondary question. Well, I have reduced my exposure in companies, but I still hold it. The percentage has come down. So, uh, if, I, if I can get you correct, uh, you're basically uh, removing the excesses on both sides. Your parameters. That's an accurate description, yes. Yes, sir. In that case, turnaround companies would be complete stress. So it can come in as an exception. If it otherwise, uh, it's a, for example, I said I had bought Great Eastern Shipping. Great Eastern Shipping did not qualify on these parameters. But Great Eastern Shipping was purchased because, first of all, it's the number one company in that industry. And shipping was at a multi year low when, when we bought it. But the important thing is, the shades understand this business very thoroughly. They, 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 they know practically everything there is to be known about this business. And they were buying ships anew after a gap of seven years. After 2007, since 2007 to 2014, they were net sellers of ships. In 2014, they turned net buyers of ships. Now, when the ship owner is turning bullish on his industry, I would give that a little more credibility than some sell side analyst who is still saying sell. <laughs> yes or no? We cross check this with some other shipping lines in North America. For example, the biggest oil tank of wheat is a company called Frontline. They were also buying new ships. Now, if ship owners are beginning to get bullish, that's a good sign. And on top of that, the stock was available at a dividend yield of more than 5% in 2014. Plus, it was available at a discount of more than 45% through its declared net asset value. Every quarter they declared net asset value. And net asset value in shipping industry is close to realizable value. I'm confident of that. So, a discount of 45% was, in my opinion, sufficient margin of safety. So, the waiting period can be long, but you are buying it at such a sufficiently large discount that you don't mind waiting for a long period. That's the idea. So turnaround is also included. It can come in as an exception. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Do you find any turnaround on the energetic sector right now? As we saw two years back, the studio sector. Even if I do, I will not tell you. So, is it cater for the promoters? Percentage bonus? See, I have no problem with Indian management or family run companies or PSU management or these things are secondary. It should be efficiently run. It should have treated minority shareholders fairly. That's all. And this you can judge only with a track record. If there's anything in the track record that suggests that minority shareholders' interests have been seriously compromised, this is not my question. But I, I have to caution you at the stage that I've yet to come across any company that is 100% pure. So if you are looking for pristine purity, you're not going to find it. Every company is. Somewhere between 100% good and 100% evil. So, but there is a threshold beyond which we will not go. That's the idea. Means, say, some doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. As long as they are running the company well, how does it matter if they are running having 25%? What do promoters hold in HDFC unit? See, generally, it's more than what timeline I attach, it is the clients what they attach. <laughs> so, uh, by and large, I think within two to three years' time, it should work. By and large. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we make, uh, we go wrong. And uh, as long as we are wrong in less than three out of ten occasions, I think it's still okay. My ambition is to be right on seven out of ten. Yes, sir. They are not qualified. No bank will ever qualify. No NBFC will qualify. All of them will be purchased as exceptions. Does pessimism bring up or make us I 
think uh, for all of us, uh, Chandrakant Bai has been a very big influence in our life. The, the, apart from the idea of investing, I think as a human being, there's a lot that you could learn from him. A, he's a remarkable person. He was a remarkable person. Um, I have had the privilege of closely interacting with him on, on many occasions. And, uh, his, his humility, his, uh, you know, his clarity of thinking, and his <coughs> discipline is, is a great thing. He never bothered about how much money somebody has made. I think that's a very, very important trait for a good investor. You should not be bothered about how much money somebody has made. Actually carefully think about it. This is the primary cause for problem. Most investors left to themselves are happy with a 16-18% rate of return until they find out that their neighbor has made 25. <laughs> <laughs> that's when the problem starts. So and up to a point, it's good to have competition. But beyond a point, it gets destructive. You remember 160% return? Mm -hmm. At that time, if you try to be number one, you are in for trouble. But Chandrakant Pai never was like that. He, he completely stayed away from the IT boom in 1990. He was happy about it. So it's something that, uh, you know, despite his, uh, his wealth, he was a very humble person and lived a very simple middle class life throughout his life. I think it's a uh, it's been a big, big inspiration for all of us. And of course there are others. I, I, I admire Mukesh Bhai for his, uh, several of his speaks. I have been fortunate enough to work with the guys like uh, Prashant and Chandrish Nigam. I have had close interactions with you know, Sethi of Morgan Stanley. Even today I meet him quite often. I, I admire Bharat Shah of ASK, formerly of Birla. There are many of them, so I can't just single out a few. I, there are several I have kind of missed. So for those of us who may not have been, you know, got a chance to know more about the country, you talked about a little bit about the character, a little bit more about the I think he was a remarkable person. Uh, as a human being, he was a remarkable person. He used to talk with equal felicity about Joseph Schumpeter's theory of creative destruction and the Bhagavad Gita. And you link the two. No, it's, a, it's a phenomenon. It's a, he never had a cell phone in his life. You know, it's, a, <laughs> it's something. And he, until 80 years, until he was 80 years, he used to jog every day. He used to go to the gym every day. He was very spartan in his food habits. You know, he is the only person in the world who can call masala dosa as junk food. <laughs> yes, sir. You started your PMS today. Did you find any stocks and you could? I would, I would see. I, I am still buying stocks even today. But I am not. I, I grant you that the percentage of attractive stocks has come down in the last four years. There is no doubt about it. Let's call a spade a spade. So, the percentage of attractive good quality companies is definitely not. But as I, I am always amazed at this. Every market gives some new set of opportunities. People ask me, what do you think of the market? Is the market too expensive? When they talk of market, they talk of the index. Invariably, right? The biggest bull market that I have seen in my career ended in January 2008. That was the biggest bull market that I have seen in my career. <clears throat> At that time, the index was 21,000. Right? It again touched 21,000 sometime in 2014. So after about seven, seven and a half years, it touched. Uh, after nearly seven years, it touched 21,000 again. In the in the interim, it had fallen to 8,500 and recovered. So if you had just in, invested in the index, it gave zero returns for about seven years. You would have made about 1% dividend yield per annum. That's all you would have made. But let's assume there were two investors in the beginning of January 2008. One investor had a portfolio of Asian Paints, ITC, GlaxoSmithKline Consumer, Aisha Motors, <laughs> TPK Prestige, and Page Industries. Another investor had Unitech, DLF, GMR, GPK, <laughs> Jack Corp, 
land quality. Okay? Now, the, the market was the same for them, for both of them. The, but the results would have been dramatically different. So what matters is what you buy, at what price you buy, and how much of it you buy. In, I can show the other examples also. In, in, in the technology boom of 99-2000, Nestle, Procter & Gamble, BHEL, you know, BEML, Bharat Electronics, State Bank of India, Punjab National Bank, all of these were available at throwaway prices because they were supposedly called old economy. Yes, new economy was booming. That was the only one that was booming. So in any bull market, there are sectors that are ignored, that are forgotten or neglected. So it's good to begin a search amongst the ones that have been neglected. I'm not saying you immediately buy it, but at least begin a search at that point of time. Oh, yes, sir. Do you look at uh, 52 weeks low uh, for your good peak? If it is a 52 week low, I begin my searches there. <laughs> if it is a 104 week low, I begin to shed tears of joy. <laughs> <laughs> there have been recently I bought a company which, which is uh, three years low. <laughs> I get ecstatic. <laughs> <laughs> and that fits into your parameters? Some of them do. Many of them do. Of course, there will be one or two exceptions. Like Great Eastern Shipping was an exception. Yes, sir. What importance do you place on management interactions in your process? I think it is more important for a smaller sized or medium sized company. A very large company like, I can't expect Mr. Vishal Sikha to give me a one-to-one -one interview. It is not going to happen. Right? But if it's a medium to small size company, then obviously we look for management interaction. And nowadays, companies have become very, you know, semi-friendly. You know, they immediately have to take my visiting card and put it on their website that I have met this gentleman and so on and so forth. But it's okay. I am not insisting on a one-to-one -one meeting. Even if it's a group meeting, it's still okay. And today, the internet has become far more, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great tool for research. So much so that now there is a problem of too much information. I have to sift from the noise and the real quality information. But yes, it's, if it's a medium or small size company, definitely we expect to meet the man. You said there's one in the company which you then how you boil down to the 25%? Yeah, the most important thing is the valuation, right? Valuation. Yeah, as I said, the top of the list will be the Hindustan Lever and Nestle and all these fellows. I will not buy any of them. And a, at, at least not now. And a company with 24 you attach with 7%? No, 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 not necessarily. So then it is the, 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 there, there have been companies which score 17 or 18 which are, which are purchased more than the companies which score 20. It, it depends on the valuation also. No? Yeah. So. And quality of the growth. So growth would Expected growth rate also, yeah. future growth rate. That is also an important part. So these are the first filters. These are not the final yeah, things. How do you practice building companies available at 50 60 percent discount? I am quite frankly not a fan of this holding company investment because I generally don't get the full realization of that value. You know, I have not made these mistakes in the past. Somebody asked me my past mistakes. I have made the mistake of, you know, this company is holding so many shares of that other company, so therefore it should be trading at. But it, unless it is realized by you, it is of no use to you. So this holding company discount, I think, is deserved. <laughs> Sir, 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 yes. sir, since you do PMS, uh, if one client comes in <coughs> right now, you buy Infosys for it. Eight months later, Infosys 20% higher, another client comes in. How much do you give the same weight? No, obviously not. It will be different. It will be different. Yes, sir. Any thoughts on special situations of like, say, something or, or only your criteria? I mean, so demerger is an added benefit. It's like a chutney to my idli. That's all. <laughs> it's not the main thing. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's an additional 
to us. Yes, sir. On valuation, many speakers have told valuation the expenses. Uh, generally, interest rates in the economy is coming down. Don't you think when interest rates are coming down, overall we are set for a higher elevated valuation? But to what extent? That is the question. You know, if something is today trading at six times its last 10 year average valuation, what the interest rate should be minus 10 percent to be for that <laughs> interest rate? I, I can't justify that. Then everything has a you know proportion, right? If it goes well beyond proportion, we need, yeah. What's your view of uh, on holding cash in your portfolio? Cash is a residual asset. Okay. It's not. I don't pre-decide that I want to hold so much cash. Until I am able to deploy it in equity, to that extent it is cash. Okay. So it's it's not a it's not a hard and fast decision. Tomorrow, if I find an opportunity, I use the cash that I have. Somebody here had a question. Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit about your some of your really big successes that you remember, and what was your thinking at the point of time when you made those buys? Recent ones? No, recent old whatever ones. The, the more recent one, I can talk quite uh, comfortably about uh, Indraprasth Gas. Now, Indraprasth Gas, you know, in 2012, there was a, a PNGRB uh, order issued that uh, they wanted to control the final selling price of gas. So the stock tanked quite sharply. But there was enough reason for us to believe that this order will not pass muster. You know, they, they, there was. Uh, no, because the PNGRP Act itself doesn't give the power of, of price control to PNGRP. So you studied the Act? Yes. I studied the Act. Then, of course, the Delhi High Court judgment came within one month. The, the company immediately went to the Delhi High Court. The judgment of the Delhi High Court was quite uh, illuminative. If you read the Delhi High Court judgment, which is still available on the website of the Delhi High Court, it's, it very clearly says that price control is is advisable only when there is a restrictive trade practice, which is not the case in the present instance. It is mentioned in the judgment. Now, I don't think the judgment can be clearer than that. So, I found it difficult to accept that the Supreme Court will overrule a categorical ruling of this kind. Of course, there was uncertainty. It was not as if uh, it was certain that the Supreme Court will not overrule it. But I there were other press reports which were not completely believable that the, the counsel for PNGRB had told the Supreme Court in one of the hearings that they are not going to insist on the file controlling the final selling price of gas. It's a press report, so I, I use that as an additional information. In addition to all of these things, let's look at the, the, op, uh, the environment in which the company was operating. It was operating in the national capital region. And the national capital region had a Supreme Court ruling which says that all public transport vehicles have to run only on gas. And we were seeing a shift from subsidized LPG cylinders to piped natural gas. We were also seeing that shift. The shift is now more pronounced in, in the last two, three years. But at that time also the shift had been to happen. The beauty of this business is a customer becomes a customer for life, almost for life. So any, and it's a monopoly, almost a monopoly. There is no other company that can sell gas in, in, in the Delhi National Capital Region. Even if they come today, they have to pay a, a, a transmission fee for in the first gas to, to compete. And that will immediately bring down their uh, competitive edge. So, and where do you get 10,000 square feet of land to set up a CNG station in Delhi city? Even if you are able to get 10,000 square feet of land, at what price will you get? These, oh, that was, that was so one. Couple of more <laughs> That's what you're coming yeah. up with. <laughs> See, I think the industrials of uh, 2013 were, were really great buys Because at that time, FMCG was the only one that was favored. Now, good quality companies like, uh, you know, Brentville Norton or Vesuvius, or even BST tillers, these, these are available at really throwaway prices at that time. Um, I bought some, uh, not Carburanda, I bought LG equipment, 
that time. But the earnings of these companies would have been very depressed. So what was the valuation parameter that you used to kind of take out? I mean, PS and all would have, I would also have looked at them, they would all have looked 30, 40 P, you know. So what was the parameter? So they were, you see, the, I told you only two days. I look at the valuation of that time compared to its, its tenure average and also compared to its estimated growth rate in earnings. So after five years of depressed, uh, you know, industrial activity, you were confident that the earnings will, will recur beyond what the fee market was putting at that time. That was the, that was the, uh, then uh, in terms of misses, there have been many. Uh, Aishan Motors was one classic example. I made a mistake in uh, Praj industries. I have never been successful in Praj industries. I have, in fact, I have never been successful in most of the commodity stocks that I have purchased. I have not been successful. I think the only success I have had is in national aluminium. Was a decent uh, success. And a bit of Hindustan zinc uh, about three, four years ago. But I didn't hold it for too long. Most commodities I have not made. I have never been successful in cement investing. Never. Yes, sir, you had a question. Sir, uh, with the recent uh, technological developments happening in the world, like across the sector, like uh, electric vehicles, uh, 3D printing, Across the sector, there is some technological change happening in the, all the various sectors. Yes. So, how uh, relevant it would be uh, that older companies uh, would get impacted in such kind of scenario? Yes, it's a good question. I think it's a, it's a uh, uh, we have to keep our eyes open. We can't take anything for granted. Um, I think 3D printing or um, even electric vehicles, it's definitely a threat. But is it an immediate threat? Because I, I have spent some considerable time speaking to some experts, both uh, who are based in India and who are based abroad, about the future of the hydrocarbon driven vehicles. And they have almost unanimously told me that uh, for the next 20 years at least, that there are significant improvements possible in the internal combustion engine. You know, already we are talking about Euro 6 and Euro 8, you know, and India, we are just going from Euro part 3 to 4. So there is still a lot of catching up to do in terms of improvement in uh, emission norm using internal combustion engine itself. The other thing about electric vehicles is that you need a nationwide network of charging stations. You know, it, it may take some time for, for all that to happen. Maybe in the San Francisco Bay area it has become popular. But for it to become popular throughout the United States may take some time. I am not saying you completely ignore that risk. You should not. It's a, it's a valid risk. But let's keep our eyes open. The only company that I, I, I still have a small portion is Bosch. I don't have any other auto ancillary company. And Bosch is, in, in my opinion, the, the strongest in that field. I am not buying Bosch now, but I am still holding on to the ones that I have held for a long time. Because many of them have not completed 12 months only, I am not selling right now. <clears throat> but uh, yes, it's a, it's a threat that we have to keep our eyes and ears open. If something comes up which promises to alter the landscape, then we have to exit. Right. Also, sir, you have seen many cycles of your career. So, uh, does all these technological developments in past also have, uh, have come across many technological developments? So does all the technological development uh, does pose a threat? Because uh, by the time we think of electric cars, there might be something else coming up. That is true, but normally in any technological development, the providers of the technology don't benefit as much as the users of the technology. Right? In the 20th century, for instance, the biggest technological change was the automobile, the airline industry and the railroads, right? The automobile company, how many of them were profitable? It benefited the user, it benefited the customer, right? But it, for, for example, airline industry. It's a great technological revolution in the, in the mid 20th century. But how many airline companies were profitable? The users benefited. Similarly, telecom. There was a huge, remember, late 90s, so much of underseat, uh, you know, cabling, and this and that. The users were the BPO industry. 
the uh, software industry, they benefited. How many telecom companies were profitable? So I think when a technological change happens, let's invest in the users of the technology rather than the suppliers. Any reason for not looking into auto, auto and salary sector? We find so many, uh, like auto industry in India is producing 3 million. Can you, can you suggest to me two or three ones that are cheap? Yeah, I'm just asking why, why this sector is not uh, in, into your life. I had it three years ago. I had many of them three years ago. Please try your laptop. So when was the last one? Did you buy anything recently? Yes. 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 See, in industry, sometimes, as I said, sometimes PE is relevant, sometimes enterprise value to sales is relevant, sometimes price to book value is relevant. In a financial company, I may not use PE. In industrials and cyclicals, I have to use enterprise value to sales. Because the PE is so depressed after four years of recession. So, in, in, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a different valuation parameter for such companies. PE is relevant only in some industries. 